around the world, the spirit is moving and a voice is being heard. Welcome to the Voice of Evangelism with David Langford. You can write to the Voice of Evangelism at P.O. Box 502, Kayser, North Carolina, 28020. We'll give you that address again at the close of today's broadcast. But here now is David Langford. Hello, friends. This is Pastor David Langford. We'd like to welcome you today to this edition of the Voice of Evangelism International Ministries. It's a new week. It's Monday, October the 21st, 2019, and we're still in our teaching series, Looking at Salvation. We started off with the depravity of man, and now we've gone into the portion where we're studying salvation. As the psalmist declared in Psalms chapter 3, verse 8, salvation belongeth unto the Lord, simply meaning it's his gift he gives to mankind. Therefore, there's nothing you can do, there's nothing I can do to earn salvation. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Simply put, God, through his sovereignty, deity, and majesty, he takes away any opportunity for men to try to take credit for their salvation, lest they boast, and they decree, they declare, I have done something concerning my salvation. If that's the case, Jesus died in vain. There would be no need for Christ to go to the cross and suffer such a heinous death in suffering, marring, mutilating his body, being spat upon, beaten, despised, blasphemed, castigated, impinged. All of these things happened because he and he alone paid sin's debt. And there's nothing that mankind can do other than believe. That's why salvation is such a beautiful thing. What does it take for a person to be born again? Romans 10, 13, it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. In Acts 16, 31, the jailer questioned Paul and Silas, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And their response was, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved, and thy house. Is that not simple? But yet religion, the trappings of men, make salvation so arduous and so difficult that you have to do this and you have to do that and you have to go this way and you have to go that way. No, Jesus is not a way. Jesus, my friend, is the only way. John chapter 14, verse 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man come unto the Father but by me. Jesus, Jesus alone is the Savior and Redeemer of mankind. I do want to make mention today before we get into the program, our upcoming revival meeting in Hickory, North Carolina, April the 16th through the 19th, 2020 at the Hickory Metro Convention Center. This year's theme for the revival or next year's theme for the revival is power failure in the church. I just got an email the other day from a pastor in India who's coming He's asked me would I help him with his motel bill. He's going to take care of his on-plane fare and means to get here to the United States. But he asked would I help him with that, and I'm going to help him because he wants to come and hear a pure, unadulterated word from the Word of God. Last year, or I should say this year uh, in our meeting, we had people from 38 states and six or seven countries. So I'm expecting that or even greater uh, anticipation or anticipation in the people coming and, and participating in what God is doing. We're living in a very excited time. It is a time to be grateful. It is a time to be thankful. We're seeing the world uh, become more cynical. Literally, their thinking, their thinking has become depraved, and they're more cynical, and uh, they're not interested in the winning of souls. So that's why God calls and sets men apart, establish the church that people might be one 
into the kingdom of God here in this end time hour. So put it on your calendar, April the 16th through the 19th, 2020, our upcoming revival meeting at the Hickory Metro Convention Center, Hickory, North Carolina. Myself, Steve Quell, Russ Dizdar, Jimmy D. Smith, Doug Hagman, others will be there. We're anticipating a great time, and of course, we're trying to get the City Auditorium in Rome, Georgia, booked as well for next October, and we're anticipating God to bless and, and touch us there as well. We just believe that when we set our hands to work in the kingdom of God, that God will bless and God will reward that which we do concerning his kingdom. God is just. God is righteous. He'll be a debtor to no man. Whatever you do, God will repay you over and over again abundantly for your work and labor of love. We're told in Hebrews chapter 6, verse 10, for God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love, which you have shown to the saints and that you minister and do minister. God will not forget your work, neither your labor of love. Amen. We've been trying to help you understand from the book of 2 Thessalonians and from the book of Revelation chapter 3, verse 5, that God has the ability to blot out anyone's name from the book of life in the event they fail to confess Jesus Christ as their Lord. It's better known as the doctrine of confession, the doctrine of confession. Now, in Matthew chapter 10, verse 32, 33, Jesus said, Whosoever therefore shall confess me before men, him will I confess also before my Father which is in heaven. But whosoever therefore shall deny me before men, him will I deny also before my Father which is in heaven. And this was the peril and danger of the apostle Peter as Christ was headed to Calvary, and that he denied Jesus. He was not willing to confess Christ before men. Why? He was fearful. He was afraid for his life. And so when the last accusation was made and the damsel said unto Peter, Surely thou art with Christ, for thy speech betrayeth thee, at that point, Peter began to curse. Peter began to swear vehemently, I do not know Jesus Christ. And no sooner than those words came from his fleshly lips, the rooster crowed. And Peter remembered the words of the Lord because Christ said to Peter, Peter, before the cock crows, you shall deny me thrice. You shall deny me three separate times. In my mind's eye, I can see, I can imagine, when Jesus said that to the apostle Peter, Peter turned and stepped away from the presence of Christ, and he thought within himself, I know he's the Christ, I know he's the son of God. I know he has demonstrated he knows all thoughts, all human behavior. But on this time and this matter, this subject, he's wrong. I will not do this. I will not do what he said I will do, especially three times. But see, Jesus had already warned Peter in Luke twenty two thirty one, 31. He said, Simon Peter, Satan hath desired to have you that he might sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for thee that thy faith fail not. And when thou art converted, strengthen the brethren, the brethren. Satan in the Greek says, he exceedingly demanded that Jesus give him Peter's so, Jesus said, Satan hath desired to have you. He's coveted your soul, Peter. He's exceedingly demanded that I give him your soul. Why? That he might 
sift you as wheat. Now, the word sift there in the Greek means to pierce, to riddle, or to perforate like punching holes into. Sift, a sieve. I remember my grandmother putting flour in a sieve and cranking the little handle, and she's sifting the the flour to make biscuits or uh, uh, dough to make the pies and dumplings and all of those things she used to make when I was a little boy growing up. There was a sifter. She'd sift the flour. This is what Jesus was declaring that Satan was demanding he give Peter his soul to the devil. Jesus give it to him so he can sift him. But Jesus said, Peter, I've prayed for thee that thy faith fell not. When thou art converted, strengthen the brethren. Now, Peter's faith failed, but not utterly failed. He wasn't utterly destroyed. Why? As soon as the rooster crowed, the apostle Peter, I believe personally, now I don't have Bible for this, just one of my personal convictions, he went back to the same Garden of Gethsemane, got in some close proximity where Christ had just been, and had come from, and he fell on his knees and prostrated himself, and he wept profusely and wept. The Bible said he wept bitterly. And, of course, Jesus, the Savior, the one who forgives mankind, forgave Peter. But, see, Jesus knew Peter would stumble. I love Psalms 37, 23, which says, The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. Though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down, for the Lord upholdeth him with his hand. I have been young, now I am old, yet have I not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. Though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down. And I, and I use this analogy, having raised four children, and I remember so many times holding their little hands when they were two, two and a half, three years old, toddlers, walking across a parking lot. I'm holding their hand, and they may stumble, they may trip up a little bit, and they would fall. And they do fall, but they don't utterly fall. Why? Because as their dad and me having a hold of their hand, I just gently pull them up and they are not utterly cast down. Did they fall? Yes. But I kept them from being utterly fallen and cast down. That's where the grace of God comes into our lives. Titus 2.11 says, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared unto all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust." We should live soberly and righteously and godly in this present world, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Christ Jesus. I want to emphasize that just for a moment today. Grace. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared unto who? How many? Unto all men. So people will never have the opportunity to say, God, you never made an appeal for my soul. Now, let me say this. God may make one appeal for some people, maybe two, maybe three. He's willed, we talked about that last week, he has willed, he has predestined that all men be saved, but all men will not repent and accept the gift of salvation. You can offer me a gift I can refuse it. I can say I don't want your gift. Why? Because I may feel somewhat of an obligation to you. That's the nature of humanity. But when Christ redeems a man, he doesn't make you obligated to him. He wants you to serve him and love him because you have a, an affinity. You have an attraction. You have a love for him. See, you couldn't pay for salvation if you tried to. That's why I loathe and I grapple and I struggle with those who believe you have to do something along with repenting to be saved. It's not true. 
Jesus said in Mark 1, 15, the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. Now, this will be the third portion of this series when we introduce to you repentance and repenting. We're not there yet. We're getting there. We're going to get there here in a few more programs. But I want you to understand, Jesus preached repentance. Jesus preached repentance. The Apostle Paul preached repentance. John the Baptist preached repentance. The Apostle Peter preached repentance. Repentance must be preached. Yet, in spite of all the vast calamities and tragedies and the events that are taking place in America and around the world, I hear hardly any preacher crying, pleading, wailing, lamenting, repent, repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. Oh, no. Most churches want you to feel good. They preach a thin theology and a greasy grace, and they have a playboy mindset. Oh, God will just take you like you are. You're right, but you must repent first. And when you repent, you're saying, I'm sorry for my fornication. I'm sorry for my adultery. I'm sorry for my sodomy. I'm sorry for my drunkenness. I'm sorry for my cursing and swearing, and I'm, I'm sorry for my watching pornography every day. Now, you're not going to hear this preached in most nominal churches because they want you to feel good. The Holy Ghost convicts you. The Holy Ghost convicts you of sin and of unrighteousness. That's what Jesus said he would do. Why? Because we're sinners until we're saved. Now, I, I hear this statement. Well, we're all sinners saved by grace. That's not true. That's a lie, too. I'm not a sinner. I'm a Christian. Now, because I'm a Christian, it does not negate my ability to sin. Every man has the propensity, has the proclivity, has the tendency to sin. Ecclesiastes 7, verse 20, there's not a just man upon the earth that doeth good and sinneth not. The nature is there. It's called the Adamic nature. I've used this analogy scores and scores and scores of times. Has anyone listening to me, have you ever sat down with your children and said, now let me explain to you how to tell a lie and get away with something? Well, if you're any kind of a parent, you've never said that, never would teach a child how to lie. So how do they know how to lie? That sin nature, that propensity, that proclivity is already in their loins, and it came from mama, and it came from daddy. As most of you know, my wife was a very virtuous young lady when I married her. Never, never smoked a cigarette, never tasted a beer, never done anything like that. And, and, and God gave her to me, and I was the, like Paul, I was the chiefest of sinners. I, I lived in the nightclubs. I lived in the bars. I, I, I lived a very uh, sorrowful, wicked, sinful life. I won't get into all of it because it's degradating. It's debased. It's debauched. I'm ashamed of it. But there are times when our kids would do something, and from a, a, a perspective of joking, I would look at my wife and say, hmm, I believe they got that from you, Mama. And she'd look at me and say, well, you're crazy because I've never done any of those things. And the truth is, I'll take all the blame for all the silly, crazy, sinful, wicked things my children have done because they got it from their daddy. It's passed on. So you catch a child walking out of the kitchen with chocolate chips on their face and crumbs on their hands. And you say to that child, have you been in the cookie jar and you're laughing and you're smiling because you know they have been because the evidence is all over them? And what do they say? No, Daddy, I've not been in the cookie jar. And you're like, they are flat out lying to me. And you say something like this. Are you sure you've not been in the cookie jar? No. I've not been in the cookie jar. I promise you, I cross my heart. 
And you know they're flat out telling a lie. Did you teach that to them? No, you didn't. Where did they get it? That sin nature from Adam has been passed down unto all men. Now, getting back on my point, just because God saves you, redeems you, forgives you, and transforms you into a new creature doesn't mean that old Adam nature is not still there. I remember Brother George Offord. God bless his heart, one of the greatest most dedicated men of God I've ever known in my life. I was probably 32, 33, 34. Uh, I just built the new church in Charlotte, and I had him. He's from South Carolina. I had him up preaching for me. People think I have a great retention of Bible. I mean, this guy would make me look like a first grader with his skill and knowledge of the Scriptures. And we were coming home that afternoon. My wife had taken the van with the other four children, and uh, he and I rode together in his car coming home. We were talking. I'll never forget this as long as I live. He looked at me and said, David, let me give you a piece of advice. Don't ever let Adam out of the coffin. Keep the coffin lid nailed shut. He said, because young man, if Satan can get out of the coffin, get you out of that coffin through trial and temptation or whatever, he'll cause you more harm and more damage in one day that you could fix in a lifetime. I never forgot that. Why? Because when I would find myself encroaching a compromising situation. I remember the words of that astute, wise man. Don't let Adam out of the coffin. Keep the coffin lid nailed tightly shut because if he can get out, he will cause more irreparable damage in an hour than you can fix in a lifetime. There are those in our midst, who were in ministry, and they're still in ministry, but they sinned. They sinned, grievous sins. And God allowed them to be exposed for their sin. And now, like Jacob, they walk with a limp. Don't think Satan doesn't want you living out the rest of your life with a limp. Don't think he doesn't want you hampered, hindered, encroached in some capacity the rest of your life. If he can do nothing else but bring condemnation into your life, into your heart, into your spirit, and you live under the shame and guilt and condemnation of sin, he causes men and women to be ineffective. They've lost their effectiveness. Why? Guilt, condemnation. I can't say that. I did that. I can't preach that. I'm guilty of that. But see, that's how he paralyzes men. Think about the psalmist David, an adulterer and a murderer. Yet, the scriptures declare he was a man after God's own heart. Most of you, just about everyone listening to me, you've never murdered anyone, neither committed adultery. Yet David did those egregious sins. And again, while standing on that balcony, watching Bathsheba as she bathed, Say what you will, but the Holy Ghost said to David over and over and over again, get off of the balcony, quit looking at that woman, and get out of here and get your eyes back on the Lord Jesus Christ, Elohim. But, again, the Adamic nature was there, and he responded to that fallen nature. And of all the times she was able to conceive, it was that moment. She conceived. She conceived. Uriah, her husband, 
David now finds out Bathsheba has conceived and is pregnant. So David's going to try to conceal his adultery. Uriah being the servant of God that he was a soldier, David brings him to the, cow, the palace and gets Uriah totally drunk and inebriated, gets him knee-walking drunk. Some of you guys know what I'm talking about when I say knee-walking. Some of you don't. Some of you do. He said, go, go, go home. Don't, don't bother to go back to the, the battle. Go, go home. But you know what he did? He was such a man of integrity. Uriah, he goes home, but he sleeps on the front porch. He never goes in to see his wife or have a relation with her. God was protecting the innocent. See, God protected Uriah. You say, well, he was drunk, but he was protecting him from being associated with that cover-up. Then when that did not work, David writes Joab a letter. And in the letter, he tells Joab, put Uriah in the front of the, tr the troops, rush up in the heat of the battle, but already have forewarned and foretold the other men. When I say pull back, pull back, but he never told Uriah. Why? He wanted Uriah killed. Why? He's trying to cover his sin. So what does he do? Joab reads the letter meticulously. He tells all the other soldiers, we're going to engage into the heat of the battle. But once we are in the heat of the battle, I want you to pull back, digress, pull back from the heat of the battle. But no one told Uriah. And Uriah was slain. It was murder. What I find amazing is David goes about acting like everything is hunky-dory. David is living his life. Uriah is dead. He takes Bathsheba as his wife. Now she's a widow. Everything looks great. But it's not great with God. God is displeased profusely. The child is born. So we know at least nine months of time has elapsed. Has David repented? No. Has David said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner? No. He goes on with his life. As a matter of fact, one of the most sad parts of this story is David maintains his spirit of religiosity. Bathsheba bears a child, David's child. The child is sick. The child is sickly. The child is diseased. Why? It is a child birth from the refuse of sin, born because of a sinful deed, a sinful act. And God's sovereignty, God was not pleased with that. The child dies. Now, while the child is sick, David is fasting, he's praying, he's pleading with God for mercy. God save the child. God's not going to save the child because the child was conceived through adultery and murder. David's fasting, David's praying, David's pleading with God. Again, David is merely being religious. Some of you people understand fully what I'm saying. Some of you don't understand a thing I'm saying. I don't say that to be arrogant. I don't say that to be bigoted. It's because your spirituality is not at the level it needs to be to understand the deeper things of God. He should have repented immediately. But he didn't. You see, you sin, you live in sin, you don't repent, you don't cry out to God and say, God, forgive me. You just go on and act like nothing ever happened. That's what David did. But 
The Bible says in Galatians 6 and 7, be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. David sowed detriment through his flesh, and God said, don't you fool yourself. You're going to reap corruption. That goes for all of us. I know people think I'm a little too conservative. That's the problem. I'm not conservative enough. Neither are you. You sit in these mortuaries. They're not churches. I'm going to tell you what. Our God told me weeks ago in prayer. He said they're whorehouses. Oh, my God, Pastor. Whorehouses. That's right. Whorehouses. Prostituting the gospel. Prostituting their relationship. Begging for money. Pleading for money. Appealing for money. Want everybody to feel good. That's evil, that's wrong. You'll never hear us at the Voice of Evangelism ask for an offering. I thank God we don't do that. I am humbled that we don't do that because God, grace is sufficient for all of the needs. Churches are full of religious people. Most of them think, they're saved because they do their little duty on Sunday morning. Now, David's fasting. David's praying. But you know what? Go back and reread Isaiah chapter 1. He said, I'm tired of your vain. The word vain means worthless, fruitless. I'm tired of your worthless oblations. I'm sick of it, God said. I'm not going to hear you. Why? Because you got sin in your life. Sweet and bitter water, James said, can't come out of the same well. It just can't happen. But it does in most churches today. I remember one time inviting a lady to church. She said, I wouldn't dare put my foot in another church. She said, you're all a bunch of hypocrites. I said, come on, one more ain't going to make no difference. You think she got mad at me then? <laughs> I said, come on, one more ain't going to make no difference. That's her excuse. What's your excuse today for not living for Jesus? Uh, Pastor Lankford's a hypocrite. I was told somebody said the other day, I was an occult. Yeah, right. Well, if I'm in an occult, it's the best occult you've ever seen or whatever could be a part of because I'm in the kingdom of the most high God. David doesn't repent. He has no remorse. He's not saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. The child is born. The child dies. He quits fasting, he, gets, he quits praying. The servants come into his chambers and say, why have you ceased to fast and to pray? David said, the child is dead. Because the child is dead, the child cannot come back to me, but I can go to the child. I can go to where the child is, heaven. Only one problem, David. You got sin in your life. You don't want to die with sin in your life. The child dies. The child's buried. David's just living his life. He's the king. Everything's cool. He's got power. He's got authority. But one day, a prophet by the name of Nathan. Nathan. Nathan was a very courageous man. God told Nathan what David had done. He told Nathan everything that David had done. And he sent the prophet of God to indict the king, the anointed, chosen, elected man of God. He sent Nathan to indict him. Whoa. Nathan, no doubt, approaches the palace and says, can I have a word with the king? Secretary runs in there and she says, King David. The prophet Nathan is here, would like to see you. Bring him on in. Tell him to come on in and have a seat. Nathan walks in. He sits down in the presence of the king. How's things going, David? Great. Nathan, how's your life going? Great, but I've got a little problem God's dealing with me about, and I need counsel from the king. 
Can you give me counsel? You're the king. I know I'm the prophet, but, but, but can you help me here? Go ahead, Nathan. And Nathan tells the story how a rich man comes into a city and he takes the little lamb, the little ewe lamb, from a poor man. He steals, destroys the man, destroys the man's life. The rich man does all this evil stuff. And David rises up in his indignation. David's self-righteousness burst from the seams. He says, oh, that man is going to pay fourfold, and then we're going to execute that man for his ungodly, wicked deeds. Nathan, the prophet of God, points his long, bony finger in the face of David and says, Thou art the man. I'm telling you, you don't realize the world in which you live in today. There are so many vile and wicked and salacious and sinful people who have their veneer, they have their facade from Nancy Pelosi who claims she prays for the president every day. Nancy, I invite you to pray and ask God, is it right to murder babies every day in, abor in abortion because the Supreme Court justice has said it was legal. I invite you to pray today about your constituency in San Francisco where it's full of sodomites and you have you have propelled them, you have exalted them, you have lauded them through same-sex marriage. Nancy, do you ever pray about that? Oh, no, you don't. Because if you truly had God in your life and God in your heart and you prayed about that, the Holy Spirit would tell you, that is a sin, Nancy. We can't do that. You cannot murder babies. You cannot have same-sex marriage. You can't live like that, Nancy. And you want to come before me and pray for the president when your district in San Francisco is full of raunchy, randy, rancid, filthy sin? Your prayers are a stench in my nostrils, Nancy. Speaker of the House, third in line to the presidency. We have no idea how tenuous the fragility, how fragile we are as a nation and our leadership and we act like everything's all right. People say, don't listen to Pastor Langford. That guy's crazy. We'll just go back today already and write down all the Bible verses I've already shared. Take it to the Word of God. See if these things are true or not. We're told in 2 Peter 2, 6, and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes. He condemned them with an overthrow, making them an example unto those that afterward should live ungodly. Out of all the women in the Bible, from Eve in the garden, Ruth, Naomi, Esther, Mary, the mother of Jesus, I could go on and on. We're told in Luke 17, 32, by Christ's words alone, remember Lot's wife. Hello? Does anybody know Lot's wife's name? I don't. If you know her name, email me and tell me Lot's wife's name. Though we do not know her name, we are told by the Son of the living God, remember her. Why remember Lot's wife? Oh, there's something significant about Lot's wife. Because the wickedness, according to Genesis chapter 18, of the stench and the sins of Sodom and Gomorrah had come into the hearing and nostrils of God. God said, I'm now going to go down and see if what I hear is factual. Well, we know that God knew that. God killed two birds with one stone. He told Abraham, you're going to have a baby, I'm going to call his name Isaac, and I'm going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. He done two things in one visit. 
God did not usher two commandments, five commandments, ten commandments, twenty commandments through the two angels. But the angels only gave one command from God. Do not look back. Now, is that hard to obey? Hello? Is that hard to understand? Do not look back. That's all the angel told Lot, his wife, two daughters. Just don't look back. But you see, Lot's wife had a problem. Even though the angels physically took hold of her hand, you can read all this in the 19th chapter of the book of Genesis. It's all there. They took her by the hand. They're trying to lead her out of Sodom and Gomorrah, and the only commandment is don't look back. But Lot's wife had a problem. Her heart. She had an affinity. She had an affixation with Sodom and Gomorrah. And the Bible says in Genesis 19, verse 26, and she looked back from behind him, meaning Lot, her husband. She looked back from behind him, and she became a pillar of salt. Notice the words of Christ in Matthew if the salt has lost its savor, it's good for nothing to be thrown out into the streets and to be trodden under the foot of men. Do you think she ultimately was trodden under the foot of men? Yes. Why? She became a pillar of salt. She lost her savor, her saltiness. Now, I don't mean to get theologically into the Greek here, but the Greek word, excuse me, the Hebrew, I'll get it right, the Greek word in Matthew, when the salt has lost its savor, the word savor there is moros, moros. And we get the English word moron. That's right. Because she looked back, she became moronic. A moron, silly, stupid. You think I'm making all this up? Go study it. I mean, hey, I'm trying to tell you the truth. I'm going to tell you what other preachers won't dare tell you because they don't want to hurt your little feelings. He stepped on my toes. You remember that phrase in church years ago? He, preacher stepped on my toes today. Preacher sawed out a limb underneath me and made me grab a higher limb to get closer to God. Well, there's no stepping on toes. There's no sawing out limbs anymore in the church. It's all sawdust, and we play in our sin. We're all living in sawdust and playing in sin. You know, that's the thing, the thing about the voice of evangelism. We don't know from one program to the next what the Holy Spirit's going to do. I, I, I come in here to, to do what I feel like I need to do, but the Holy Spirit says, no, we're going to go another direction today. Somebody needs to hear a true Holy Spirit message from the Word of God that's got power and conviction to deter sin, unrighteousness, and wickedness in people's lives. I, I, I come in here, and I think this is way, the way I'm going to go. And the Holy Spirit says, no, we're going to go this way today, and your, your little sermonette, to these Christianettes, it's not going to be what you wanted it to be because we're going to speak directly to people's hearts today and tell them the truth. I didn't get to where I wanted to go today, but I know God, and today's message is speaking to people. I'm telling you, Hebrews 10.31 says, it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a living God. It is a fearful thing to fall into God's hands. You say, I'm a Christian. Start living like one. Well, I'm a gay Christian. I'm a drunkard Christian. I'm a fornicating Christian. I'm an adulterous Christian. So what's the difference between you 
and the old vile, wicked sinner. You just put the word Christian in front of it. Somehow that makes you sinless. Hello? You just, you just put Christian in front of it, and that somehow mitigates, it lessens your sin. See, that's, that's what the church has done to people. The church today has dumbed down Christianity. Oh, we're all going to heaven, man. We're all. We're all going to heaven. Every one of us. We're all hell proof. Why? Jesus loves us. Yeah, they said James Brown, when he died, God brought him home to give Jesus Christ a party. <clears throat> Excuse me. That's not the kind of party that God's going to have in the day of the resurrection. It's glorious. It's not sinful. It's not vile. It's not wicked. It is holy. It is pure. It is righteous. It is godly. Godly. The ungodly. Oh, no. The ungodly. They're not going to be there. You heard that cliche? I heard it when I was a young man. All my friends, we're all going to be in hell. Are you kidding me? How dare a man make a statement of that magnitude? We're all going to be in hell. I'm not going to hell for nobody. I know. Matthew 7, 13, enter ye in at the straight gate. For wide is the gate. Broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. And many there be which go in thereat because straight is the gate. Narrow is the way that leadeth unto life. And few there be that find it. Few. Just a few. So let's look at 10 people. How many is a few? Five? Well, no, that's half. Four? That's too close to half. Three? Oh, we're getting close. Two? Three? I mean, that's my understanding of the phrase, few there be that find it. Then let's go on to Matthew 7, 21. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. So from my perspective, it is imperative to do the will of God. To prove my point, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 3, for this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that you should abstain from fornication. What's God's will? Abstain from fornication. You see, the word fornication is such a broad word in the Greek. It covers adultery, bestiality, sodomy, pedophiles, abusers of themselves with mankind. That's, that's another phrase for sodomy in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9 and 10. Effeminate, effeminate, that means the people that's got the, the little limp wrist. You, you see those little guys with the skinny jeans on? They, 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 they real effeminate looking. <clears throat> Where I come from, a man is a man, a woman is a woman. Now, in other parts of this nation and country, they're out there saying, I'm a transgender you are a sinner, you're sinful, and you're demon-possessed because God made them male and female. My daughter, Lorraine, just had a baby the other week. And I was reading some days ago in First and Second Thessalonians, First and Second Timothy, and it just hit me profoundly, profusely, women are the sole bearers of children, women. Now, I'm a man. Anatomically, I don't have ovaries. I don't have a uterus. I don't have a womb. I don't have any of that stuff. My body does not produce progesterone and estrogen. It produces testosterone. And that's what makes me manly. My voice whiskers. But then we have those in the world today who say, 
I'm a man, but I'm trapped in a woman's body. So they start taking testosterone to lower their voice. Yeah. And whiskers on their face. Yeah. Hair on their chest. Yeah. Why then do you have to take replacement hormones? Because you're not that. You are side dressing yourself to make yourself something that you are not. You see, the Bible said there would be inventors of evil things. Now, we, we talk about the Internet. We talk about uh, technology. But it always ends up being evil before it's over with. If you know anything about the Internet, communication, the greatest purveyor of technology is the pornography industry. Always looking for a faster, quicker, cheaper way to get filth in your hands. Your telephone, your your computer, um, now it's on uh, uh, these television, uh, direct television. You, you order triple uh, X movies. They are the purveyors of technology to get out the filth. Inventors of evil things. You'll find that in first Romans chapter 1. They invent this stuff. Then they snare. Look at the vaping and all the stuff that's happening to these young people, lung disease and collapsing and dying. Elect <laughs> that, that's funny to me. I don't mean to be comical here, but an electronic cigarette. Uh, where I come from, it's tobacco, and it's ground up, and it's made and put into a paper and smoked. Everything is being altered and regretfully, it's being altered for all the wrong reasons. All the wrong reasons. Sin. If you don't think sin will alter your life, just keep living in it. Keep living in it. Keep drinking liquor and watch your liver. Keep watching pornography and watch your relationship with your spouse. Or if you're dating, your relationship with women. Watch it. It will deteriorate. You become desensitized. Satan is a master at desensitizing humanity and what is right and perverting it and making it become wrong. Satan. What a deceiver. What a manipulator. And he kills, he steals, and destroys. God bless you. I'll see you tomorrow. We're going to pick back up on this. I hope and I pray it's blessing and touching your heart and strengthening your hand and encouraging you to walk in the paths of righteousness. The Voice of Evangelism with David Langford is brought to you by the faithful listeners and supporters throughout America. If you're looking for an uncompromising message, we invite you to tune in each week to The Voice of Evangelism. For more information, write to The Voice of Evangelism at P.O. Box 502 Kaiser, North Carolina, 28020. That's P.O. Box 502, Kaiser, North Carolina, 28020.